Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio listeners. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true. Minus the alien abduction dreams. That sh- is not cool at all. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. Go away! Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. And a happy new year. By the way, congratulate me this Christmas. I'm going for it. No antidepressants. Somebody ought to teach that little humbug some Christmas spirit. I could feel the Christmas noose beginning to tighten. Maybe what happened next was inevitable. Ralphie, what would you like for Christmas? Horrified, I heard myself blurted out. I want an official Red Rider carbon action to an inch range ball air rifle. No, shoot your eye out. I may be just an old railroader and know nothing about lighter than aircraft, but from my layman's perspective, you need more altitude. And then I traveled to the seven levels of the candy cane forest, past the sea of swirly, twirly gumdrops, and then I walked through the Lincoln Tunnel. Christmas Eve love, I should warn you, is like a Christmas cracker. One massively disappointing bang and the novelty soon wears off. What is it you want, Mary? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Now, what do you call this scene, huh? That was a Christmas present. What fat had to spend any money on a thing like that? From your mother. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. It's the odd, odd, odd to Newfoundland. Ghostly greetings from your host, Jonathan. Mysteries, ghosts, monsters, and lore. East Coast esoterica and so much more. If it's up to you, friend, it's on the up to you found line. <laughs> Ghostly greetings from the oldest city in North America. I'm your host, John Mallard, bringing you the best in East Coast esoterica. You, my friends, have stumbled upon the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast for the month of December 2018. Happy holidays to everybody out there. A very merry Loch Ness mess to you all. You're wonderful. A masterpiece. Beautifully made. Important to people because you're important to me. Highly favored by your creator. Whether that is a god or a law of averages and physics working in tandem. You're thirsty for knowledge and addicted to wonder. You, my friend, are an oddball. And here on this show, you're family and we are one. Gather around the Christmas tree and open up your present. This is episode 63 of the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, your monthly paranormal variety show. So very fortunate to have you guys with me once again this year as we delve into a whole new topic, which it seems to be the, you know, Christmas tradition, we'll say, or holiday tradition for everybody else out there who celebrates differently than me. Yeah. We're delving into Loch Ness with our very special guest, Roland Watson, a little bit later in the show. The guy's an awesome guest. He's Scottish. He sounds like he lives next to Loch Ness. And, you know, he pretty much does. And he's a great, just wonderful guest on the topic. I think you guys are really going to like it. And, uh, you know, we really do get into some hard, tough questions about Nessie that I'm sure a lot of people would have who are skeptical or even believers. So please check that out a little later in the show. Betty Collins is here to give a wonderful meditation on giving. Laura Swinburne is just, you know, talking about some pretty crazy stuff with about reindeer. <laughs> like 
really, really scary stuff, actually. But uh, yeah, awesome, awesome Dr. Laura Lair. I can't wait for you guys to check it out. And of course, I'll have the paranormal news now, duh, once. But before we do that, I just want to throw a couple of shout outs to some people. Uh, last show you guys have probably listened, uh, which came out a month ago. I mentioned that my father was in hospital and he wasn't doing too good. Uh, since then, dad's been released from hospital, but unfortunately he had to go back in again there just the other day. Yeah. Tough month. Tough, tough month. It's, it, it hasn't been too easy on all of us here at the Mallard household, but, uh, you know, I just want to say rough times come, rough times go. Dad will be all right. He'll be out hopefully in time for Christmas. And, uh, you know, the holidays are all about new beginnings, and I'm hoping there's going to be some new beginnings for Dad. Regardless, though, uh, you know, when Dad first went to the hospital and stuff like that, there were some people who reached out to me in the podcasting world, believe it or not. I'll be honest, uh, my own best friend didn't even give me so much as a call when Dad went to the hospital because he had no idea what was going on. He just, yeah, I was pretty mad at him about that, but you know what? People in the podcasting world actually checked up on me, sent me some messages, so... A very special thank you to Jim Mallard of the Mallard Report, Cat Ward of the Paranormal Heart, and Justin Cancellieri of Paratruth Radio. Thanks so much to you three. And last but certain, at least on that list, would be Brian Bowden. Uh, you may know him from Inside the Goblin Universe, and I was just on his show, No Boo Bo Me, you know, which actually stands for Nobody But Me. Yeah, if you want to have like a dirty little Christmas, you got to listen to that episode of me on No Boo Bo Me because... You know, I kind of let loose and I curse a lot and I'm, I'm just completely out of the odd of Newfoundland paranormal podcast way of doing things. I'm actually just <laughs> letting loose, so to speak. I think you guys will really enjoy it. Uh, I don't curse a whole lot on my show or talk about, you know, inappropriate things because I feel like this is more of a, a family show, something I'd like to see syndicated on radio someday. But Brian, you know, he just lets it all hang out. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's good stuff. So check out his podcast. To the other podcasters, thanks so much for, for checking up on me. I, uh, I certainly appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it, it's our destiny to bury our parents. It, it's incredibly sad when it's the other way around. So, you know, I'll be honest, those thoughts have been in my head since day one, since Dad's been diagnosed with cancer. But, I mean, here we are 10 years later. I just look at this as another bump in the road. Dad will be out. He'll be healthy. He'll be happy. Just you wait. I I love Christmas time because that's what it's all about. New beginnings, looking forward to new things, and kind of reflecting on the year that you had before. And uh, me and my family like to do that every single year. We have our good tidings jar. We just break down all the good things that happen to us throughout the year and just put them in the jar. And then we... Yeah, New Year's Eve, actually, uh, open it up and check it out. So uh, that's like one of our little traditions. And there uh, been a lot of changes in my life. A lot of changes in the show this year. You know, new segments. You know, Laura's gone from the MUFON Minute to Dr. Laura's Lair. We have we took Betty on board. Betty's doing the Oracle, <laughs> voice from the Oracle, which I just absolutely adore. I think everyone is a big fan of that. It's such a chill 15 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is, every show. <laughs> it's It's really, really cool. I could not have asked for better guests this year. 2018 was absolutely stellar. When I think of having Thomas Fusco on and having William Jevning on and and now Roland Watson, I, I just... These guys and gals, all these wonderful people I had on my show this year, just a, a bottom from my heart. Thank you so very, very much for making the Odd the Newfoundland just that much more entertaining every single month when it comes out. Changes, lots of changes in my life, lots of changes in the show, like I just mentioned. But maybe you guys are dreaming a few dreams out there, and uh, I got news for you. Dreams are renewable, you know, no matter what our current situation or condition. Maybe things aren't going so great in your life. There's still untapped possibilities, and uh, those possibilities are within us and the people around us, honest to God. Like, I, I do believe that very, very much. For me, I celebrate Christmas this time of year. I am a believer in Jesus Christ, and, you know, Jesus chose broken people to follow him. It's true. He chose people who weren't perfect. He chose prostitutes and murderers and thieves. He knew that man was broken long before man did. The broken can still do many great works, myself included. Much like a car with a beaten bumper can still drive, or a child with no parents can find the love of a family, or... Somebody who hates the holidays can still find a great Boxing Day sale, let's be honest... (laughs) <laughs> we are all just a little broken and uh keep that in mind this holiday season 
Maybe you're totally against the holiday season. Maybe you hate it. Maybe you're, you know, like the Grinch and stuff. Which, by the way, I actually seen his movie. It was was pretty awesome, that new one. <laughs> you guys got to check it out. Maybe, you know, you got family out there who you haven't talked to in a while. And uh, i just throw this out there to you. Why don't you do me a little favor? Why don't you hit pause on this podcast right now? And you can come back to me in a little while. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. This podcast will always be there. But uh, there's one thing I've learned this year is that the people we love might not always be there. It's the truth of all this. So go ahead. Put this podcast on pause and go get, go ahead and give that old friend a call who you haven't talked to in a long time. I'll still be here when you come back, I promise. With that being said, guys, it was a mouthful, but now it's time for the paranormal news. And, uh, you know what? Since it's Christmas, I got you guys a little something. How about a little bumper, a brand new bumper for the paranormal news? Since it's Christmas, I'll go out ahead and I got to have a little something for all you guys and gals out there. Before I start the paranormal news, I'm going to open up this gift for you guys. Let me just, let me just open it up here for you. Uh, this outside. Yeah, here it is. A brand new bumper for the Odd Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. A new bumper for the paranormal news. <laughs> Somewhere between the funnies <laughs> and, and the obituaries is, oh, oh yes. <laughs> Paranormal news. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jesus. And you know what? I love it. Because Jesus is actually going to be the focal point of our very first little paranormal news tidbit. And uh, I want you guys to weigh in on this. What do you think of this? A painting of young Jesus has been discovered in a church Archaeologists have partially reconstructed a 1,500-year-old depiction of Jesus when he was a young man. The 6th century image, which is so weathered that it's barely visible, was discovered on the wall of an ancient Byzantine church in the village of Shivta, Israel. It is considered to be an important find because depictions of the young, short-haired Jesus, while common in Egypt and Syro-Palestine, were very rarely found in the later Byzantine artwork. The reconstruction of the image was put together by researchers at Israel's University of Haifa. The figure was short, curly hair, a prolonged face, large eyes, and an elongated nose, the study authors wrote. The neck and upper portion are also observable. To the left of the figure, another much larger face surrounded by a halo was visible. Paint traces throughout the apse suggest that these faces were part of a wider scene which could contain additional figures. With enough time, it should be possible to reconstruct more of the original image it is the only situ baptism of Christ seen to date confidently to the pre-iconoclastic Holy Land, the study authors wrote. Therefore, it can illuminate Benzenton Shiva's Christian community and early Christian art across the region. And I think it's just a, a real cool way to start our podcast, seeing as how it's Jesus' birthday and all. All right, for my next story, i got to cue some music. You know, when I think of strange places my cats, like, end up being, little honey, she winds up in strange places, and this next story, what can I say, it's the cat's ass. Okay, I gotta dig in with this. There was a man who was climbing, okay, he's a mountain climber, and he was 8,000 feet up, and guess what he found? A cat! <laughs> He couldn't believe his eyes when he found the ginger tabby on Poland's highest peak. The veteran mountaineer had ascended to the summit of Risi when he came across the feline. Despite being stranded over 8,000 feet up on the top of the mountain's northwestern peak, the cat seemed totally on phase and looked healthy, well-fed, and unconcerned with its surroundings. <laughs> Sounds like my cat, except, you know, a lot higher. He noted that the animal had been approached. He sat down to eat his lunch and then approached him. It isn't clear exactly how it ended up on the mountaintop. In my opinion, he came from a small hut of tourists under the Risse Peak on the Slovakian side of the mountain, but this is just a hypothesis, said the mountaineer. Photographs and footage and the adventurous Magi can be viewed on his Facebook page. There you go. I'm just going to say this out there. <laughs> it's like 8,000 feet in the air. I'm sorry. The only way that cat's getting there is Santa kicks him off the sleigh. <laughs> 
okay, you know, we think Christmas, we think turkey dinners, we think family gatherings, we think copious amounts of alcohol, we think lots and lots more alcohol to put up with our families, and yeah, we also think about chocolate, though, don't you? Chocolate's a huge part of pretty much every awesome holiday, and we got some news this month. The origin of chocolate has been pushed back 1,500 years. New research has suggested that chocolate may have originated outside of Mexico and Central America. Up until now, the earliest cultivation of the cocoa bean, the key ingredient in chocolate, was thought to date back to the Olmecs, who made chocolate-based beverages around 3,500 years ago. Now, though, researchers have found evidence to suggest that the first use of cocoa may have actually been by the Mayo Chinchepi culture of Ecuador as much as 1,500 years earlier. It is used by people in this area more than 5,000 years ago, way earlier than we have ever found in the Mesoamerica and Central America, said study author Professor Michael Blake. It is to us that it is domesticated, or at least under the process of domestication in this area, the discovery was made at a site known as Santa, <laughs> I'm, you can't make this up, Santa's name's here, as Santa Ana La Florida, which was first unearthed in 2002. The Mayo Conchepi people were thought to have lived there between 5,500 and 3,300 years ago. Traces of cocoa were found inside mortars, bowls, bottles, and jars at the site. It's believed that its use may have held spiritual or ritualistic significance. It means even in these distant times, it was a special use of this delicious beverage, and maybe even ceremonial beverage, that drew people's attention to it, and perhaps sparked its movement throughout the rest of America and the rest of the Americas, said Blake. And thank God it did spread, because let me tell you, it just wouldn't be the same. Seriously, life would not be the same without chocolate. <laughs> okay, so I got you guys another Christmas present. I know, I know, this is present number two. I mean, I got you a new bumper for the Paranormal News, but you know what? I got something that you're not going to believe. But first, please have a listen to one of my favorite YouTube parody songs. I'm your brain, part of the central nervous system. Your cranium's my home, and if you want to learn, then listen. I'm the boss of all the functions in your body. I weigh about three pounds, but I'm the leader of the party. The cerebrum controls your thinking and your muscles. It also stores all memories. Without it, you would struggle. The left cerebrum controls the right side of the body, and the right cerebrum and left though it is tiny the cerebellum controls your posture and your balance the coordination of your movement is also its talent it's located in the lower back of your brain it is rounded in structure as i've gone on to explain i'm your brain part of the central nervous system your cranium's my home and if you want to learn then listen i'm the boss of all the functions in your all right, all right. I'll stop, I'll stop. But you got to admit, that's, a, that's just an awesome sounding song. <laughs> and no, that's not my gift. It was to be a pretty crummy gift. I, I, I've got something new for you. I'm literally going to give you a new part of your brain for Christmas. How does that sound? <laughs> yeah. There's a hidden region of the human brain that's been discovered this month. How cool is this? A neuroscientist has identified a previously unknown part of the brain that appears to be unique to humans. To me, that's even more fascinating. Discovered by Professor George Paxinos from Neuroscience Research Australia, the new region, which has been named the Indoris Tetriform Nucleus, is found within the inferior cerebellar peduncle. My God, I have no idea what I'm talking about, which is responsible for integrating sensory and motor information. God, you, you have to have a brain to read that. Professor Paxinos had first suspected its existence decades ago, but has only now been able to confirm it thanks to advances in medical imaging technology. Exactly what this new region does, however, continues to remain a mystery. I think it's where I store my Simpsons quotes. The endorsoteriform nucleus... Good God! The endorsoteriform... The endorsoteriform nucleus is intriguing because it seems to be absent in the rhesus monkey and other animals that we have studied, he'd said, this region could be what makes humans unique besides our larger brain size. It is hoped that further studies of this new region could help scientists to develop new treatments for degenerative brain conditions such as Parkinson's disease and motor neurons disease. Very, very interesting stuff. Now let's hear from the scientist himself who made the discovery. 
This is George Paxilos, and I am a cartographer of the brain. We have constructed a new map of the human brain stem and identified a region previously not known to science. Uh, what is uh, intriguing about this region, it is not present in the monkeys we have studied. It's one of the things that uh, uh, makes us unique. This area we just identified uh, is uh, in uh, the junction between the brain and spinal cord and uh, uh, it is recipient of information from the spinal cord probably it uh, relays this information to the cerebellum a part of the brain and um, given its location I would uh, suspect it will have something to do with uh, uh, sensory motor uh, coordination uh, and uh, we named it the endorestiform nucleus because uh, it's inside this big um, freeway that connects the brain with the spinal cord. Uh, Wow, that's really interesting. So, you know, since Pearl Stan Lee passed away this month, rest in peace, Stan. I love you so much. Thank you so much for the Punisher. He just a big part of who I am. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't believe I forgot to mention Stan Lee. But this is definitely where the mutant gene is hiding. This is my theory, okay? Wait, now, before you turn off the podcast, just hear me out. All we got to do is find a way to trigger this this secret part of our brain and maybe we could fly or or have regenerative powers or, you know, make billions at the box office. It'll be great. It'll be great. <laughs> really, really interesting stuff. But I must say, sometimes not everything in life is black and white. But man, when they are, sometimes they're huge. Holy God, did you see the massive cow? The gargantuan cow that became an internet sensation. It was all over Facebook. It was everywhere. And I just have to report on this thing and give you guys some backstory. An absolutely enormous 1400 kilogram. That's like well over, <laughs> like, that's like 3000 pounds. This, this 3000 pound steer named Nickers of all names is believed to be the largest of his kind in Australia. The distinctive black and white Holstein Frasian was reportedly saved from the slaughterhouse because it was too heavy and has since become something of an internet celebrity. We have a high turnover of cattle and he was lucky enough to stay behind, said owner Jeff Pearson. In recently released footage, the enormous bovine can be seen happily grazing in a field while surrounded by dozens of regular cows who seem unperturbed by their giant sized counterpart. Nickers will now live out the rest of his days in the fields around Lake Preston near Perth. What a life it is, guys. Check out Nickers the Giant Cow. It is, he is literally twice the size of a regular cow. It's very obvious. It's, 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 it's just weird. You guys have got to check this out. <laughs> I don't want that cow for Christmas, though. Can you imagine the mess? I tell you what else I don't want for Christmas. Dolls. Man, dolls creep me out. Dolls creep you guys out. You got a little bit of that old, you know, Annabelle stuff going on. Annabelle. Carol of the Bells. See, see, there's a segue for you for Christmas. Real life Chucky attacks women's boyfriend. Here it comes. Merry Christmas to you. I want to be your friend. A woman in Peru has claimed that her possessed doll moves on its own and is prone to bouts of violence. She's <laughs> anything but a doll. The bizarre story was reported locally after the woman, whose name is Berlise, insisted that her boyfriend had left her after the deranged doll beat him up while he was sleeping. I mean, I'm not much of a fighter, but I'm pretty sure I could take someone who's only up to my kneecap. Named Daisy, the doll has allegedly been responsible for a whole host of unexplained occurrences ranging from sightings with strange shadows to physical disturbances to phantom injuries. One day, a bright light suddenly shone and my Bible fell down from the TV, said Berlise. I started to cry and the light turned off and I saw shadows all around me. I was only 18, and my dad hugged me, and when the light came on, my face was covered with cuts. According to reports, the nefarious doll, which she originally received as a Christmas present, oh, God, has attacked not only her boyfriend, but also her cousin. 
She is now desperate to keep away from the house so that it can't hurt her newborn baby. Since appearing online, the story has met with a rather understandable degree of skepticism, with some social medias using likeness to the doll Chucky, the antagonist of the Child's Play movies. To date, none of the phenomena attributed to Daisy have ever been independently verified. Oh, I don't know about this, guys, but that doll is adorable. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a sucker for a pretty face. <laughs> Oh. We had a painting of young Jesus discovered at church. Happy birthday, bro. Thanks for being there for me. A climber that found a cat 8,000 feet up the side of a mountain. Good Lord. The origin of chocolate itself being pushed back 1,500 years. Well, another region of the brain. Just what? There's another part of our brain where I think, you know, the X gene is just, just throwing it out there to you. We had a gargantuan cow and we also had a real life Chucky doll. Guys. All these stories have been odd to Newfoundland. And welcome to Dr. Norris Lair. <laughs> Power on. Uh oh. I'll get the broom. Merry Christmas to one and all. I hope you have a safe and happy holiday season from my lair to yours. This month, I want to talk about some seasonal critters. I typically associate holiday movies with critters, and maybe that is because I was raised on the Muppets, Babar, and Blue Toes. The first story is about Santa's favorite friends, reindeer, but those in Siberia. Well, unfortunately, they've been having a bit of a rough time in the off-season. There has been a heat wave which has resulted in more vegetation appearing above the melting permafrost. In one of the more unusual symptoms of this unseasonable warmth, long dormant bacteria appear to be more active. For the first time since 1941, anthrax has actually struck western Siberia. Thirteen nomads were hospitalized, including four children. This is due to the consumption of the herd animals in their traditional ways, such as eating the raw meat. The bacteria has taken an even worse toll on the wildlife themselves and have claimed up to 1,500 reindeer. According to NBC News, the outbreak is thought to stem from a reindeer carcass that died in the plague 75 years ago. As the old flesh thawed, the bacteria once again became active. The disease tore through the reindeer herds. Anthrax has broken out in Russia several times, including one outbreak stemming from a 1979 accident at a military facility. Quote, zombie bacteria that have awakened from old corpses might sound like the stuff of an old X-Files episode. However, the scary part is that this isn't made up. For one, anthrax bacteria is a hardy microbe. Interestingly, the organisms turn into spores in the cold, and they play a long game waiting for the soil temperatures to rise. Once it hits a certain threshold, they morph back into more mobile, infectious bacteria. It's estimated that anthrax spores remain viable in the permafrost for 105 years. Buried deeper, the bacteria may be able to hibernate for even longer. At the same time, where meteorological data is available, they indicate that temperatures in the region are increasing. Cattle grave sites should be monitored, they concluded, and public health authorities should maintain permanent alertness. So, Rudolph, maybe it is important to fly Santa's sleigh tonight, all the way away from that melting permafrost. One of my all-time favorite science stories that I have read in the last little while is about the recovery of the population of endangered black-footed ferrets. These little guys are precious with their little bandit-type faces. Fish and Wildlife Services are actually trying to save their little lives. A true story of goodwill to all, including critters. The FWS is working to recover the population of the endangered black-footed ferrets in the U.S., which is at risk due to an exotic plague introduced via fleas in the early 1900s. The plague affects both ferrets and their main prey, prairie dogs. 
with more than 90% of their diet made up of prairie dogs, poor prairie dogs, and their primary habitat being prairie dog colonies, the black-footed population has suffered. Previous efforts to mitigate the plague involved flea control using a powder insecticide, but some of the fleas have actually built up a tolerance to this particular insecticide. An oral vaccine that could revive the prairie dog population was developed by Tawny Rock in the U.S. Geological Survey's National Wildlife Health Center and researchers at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We are hoping this oral plague vaccine for prairie dogs will be another tool in the toolkit to mitigate the effects of plague in places where we want to maintain and expand prairie dogs in support of ferret recovery. Randy Matchett, a supervisor of wildlife biologist with the Food, Fish, and Wildlife Services, told Live Science, The vaccine, also referred to as a bait, is a food-grade pellet containing peanut butter and the vaccine. At only one gram and measuring just 1.3 centimeters in diameter, the bait is the size of an M&M. Yay! However, distribution of this bait has still been difficult. At 50 doses per acre, or one dose every 9 meters, distribute it uniformly, continuing to do so by foot would be far too labor-intensive and would take far too much time to be efficient. So they need to rely on some special helpers, or elves, if you will. The way we've been distributing the vaccine for the last five years during these experimental trials, there have been people walking with a plastic bag, counting their steps every 30 feet, and then dropping one of these little baits. That works on a 20 or 30 acre plot, but when you're looking to do thousands of acres, that becomes pretty labor intensive. A person walking can treat six to eight acres per hour, dropping them one at a time. So this is where the idea of using an unmanned air system or a drone came in. But scientists stress that using this type of system is still in the developmental phase. As the agency hopes to conduct a trial this year using a prototype, we should see some further results in the future. In the end, Machette said, we think we'll need multiple transportation methods to drop this stuff because not everyone is going to have the ability or access to use drones. So this is a story from a couple years ago, but I mean, M&M shaped vaccines raining down on prairie dogs from drones. I mean, can you imagine what those little guys are going to think? A little prairie dog popping out of his hole to see what's on the go. And lo and behold, Raining from the heavens, a little nugget of peanut butter? I mean, Santa's sleigh got nothing on this. Merry Christmas, John, and Merry Christmas one and all. Now, Igor, yes. <laughs> let's go decorate that tree. It's hard to eat fruitcake with no teeth, though. <laughs> Greetings from Betty, your oracle, with words of wisdom for your consideration during this Christmas season. The question I was presented with to answer for this Christmas season is how does the universe respond when we give? And there are many, many answers to that question. If we give from the heart, not for the sake of giving, but from a place of love, we open our hearts to everything good this universe has to offer. The best case of giving from the heart that I personally have ever witnessed was from my own mother, firsthand. My mother worked as a seamstress for many, many years. My mother also had a sister-in-law who lived probably a dozen doors away, who was a diabetic. And my aunt loved 
her sweets, but she knew, as a diabetic, she could not eat those sweets that she so, so longed for. So, my mother, in her wisdom, learned how to cook for a diabetic. Because, you see, my father was a diabetic as well. And my mother kept him alive. as And she really did keep him alive for 89 full years with a specific diet to keep his sugar in check. She would bake my aunt the most beautiful cakes and cookies. And they were all... It was, wasn't sugar-free. However, mom would, use a, mom would use an artificial sweetener in there. But my aunt received what she was looking for. She wanted her sweets. She got her sweets. And as a seamstress, mom did a lot of wedding gowns. It was her specialty. It was to refurbish and any wedding gowns that needed any alteration at all, mom was there to do that. At Christmas time, sometimes, n not sometimes, every year, mom would be very embarrassed about the number of gifts under the tree for her with her name on them. She'd say, my goodness, this is ridiculous. Look at all these gifts. I'd say, yes, mom, they're for you, but this is ridiculous. I shouldn't have all of those gifts. And my retort to her every Christmas, every year, was always the same thing. Mom, what you've given all year long, you are now getting back at Christmas time. Mom was, when, let's put it this way, she was a good receiver. When my mother received a gift, it mattered not what it was. She was so incredibly grateful for the smallest, the most trivial thing or the largest. She knew all about how to give and how to receive and in turn, she taught her family. Everything my mother did was from her heart. Everything. So, the other side of when we give expecting to receive, what we receive is generally the opposite of what we expect. This universe has a sense of humor. It sees and it recognizes and loves humility. Giving expecting to get is not at all humble. In actual fact, that is what is most commonly called greed. What we give, the universe always gives us back. It always, always returns love, and anything else that we give, even if it isn't love. We humans sometimes are not really good at receiving. Sometimes I've heard people say that, well, if I won that lottery, if I, if I was given X amount of dollars, if I was given, I would not know how to receive it. Well, you would, you would start by saying thank you. But in that receiving being scary, it's all the mind chatter that we've heard over the years that we've, we've been, it's been instilled in us. We may have to step up, but can we? Are we good enough? Can, what happens if I, I step up and I'm turned down again? Oh, what, what is going to happen to me? If I give expecting to receive, the universe will show me the lesson in that. Because there is a lesson in that. There's a, a lesson I need to learn around giving. And why am I expecting to get? What am I expecting to get? Or how about the consequences for those who we expect to give back to us but don't? Is it the after all I've done for them type of accepting? We have to get past 
what we do for others and what we give in order to feel the love that the universe has for us. This universe does not register a negative. We energy bodies, because that's what we are, we are all bodies of energy, vibrate. We, we vibrate at our own energetic level. The universe's and the Earth's vibration is a very high vibration. The vibration of giving and receiving with love is the same vibration as the universe and the Earth. The universe likes when we give from our heart and will give us more to give. When the universe gives to us and we are exceptionally grateful, the universe gives us more to be grateful for. It's a very interesting universe we live in. The universe's response to negativity sometimes is no response at all or a way over the top response. And when I say way over the top, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about anything that's gentle on us. If we give expecting to receive, we'll receive. It won't be what we're looking for, though. So when we give from a place of love, you receive from that same place. If you give and give and give and give and give and do not receive, ask why. And now you'll say to yourself, who do I ask? Ask yourself. Ask your soul. Why? I've given and given and given and given and given and I'm not getting anything back. There is a clue. When you ask, you will be shown, whether it be a song on the radio, a sign on the side of the road, the name of a business that you're passing by. It could be the simplest, but you will receive the answer. Know that your giving never goes unnoticed, ever. The other side of it, the universe does not understand a negative. And a lot of people, when I've said that, and a lot of people look at me and, what do you mean by that? What, what, what do you mean it doesn't understand a negative? So I will use Mother Teresa as an example. Mother Teresa was once asked to go to an anti-war rally. Mother Teresa's response was no, I shall not attend an anti-war rally. When you decide to have a peace rally, then I will attend. So can you hear the difference in that? I will attend a peace rally, but I will not attend an anti-war rally. Why put the word war in a place where you want peace? You get in your car and you drive out the highway. You're, you're getting in your car to, to drive across the island, for instance. And you've got 14 people behind you saying, watch the most, be careful of the most. Watch the, watch the, watch the most, be careful of the most. So you sit behind your steering wheel and the very first thing you think about is, oh, what if I hit a moose? So right away, you've put a moose in your vision. Guaranteed before you get to your destination, you will see more than one. Many highway trips I've taken, I've said to people, will say, watch the moose. I don't think about moose when I'm on the highway. People say, my goodness, how do you avoid them? By not thinking about them. It's the easiest way. That's what the universe does when we give. The universe responds. It will always respond. So, how about this question? How does the universe respond 
when we receive gratefully. There's a different concept. So people actually shut themselves off by not receiving, by saying, no, 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 I don't, you, you don't need to do that. No, 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 no. Are you one of those who won't pick up the nickel or the dime that's, that's on the sidewalk or the road because eh, that's just dirty money there on the ground? Or are you one of those who picks it up and says, yes, Thank you. Now I have more money than I had a minute ago. It might only be five cents, but it's still more than I had a minute ago. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I can guarantee you that you will end up with more money in your pocket than you've ever dreamed of. If you are grateful for every single thing that comes into your life, even the not so good things. Because the not-so-good things, when they come into our life, they come in to teach us a lesson. There is always goodness, always goodness, in even in the worst-case scenario. And that, that can take us down a whole different road. And I could speak for hours on that. However, I'm going to tell you this little tidbit. And this is what I will end off today's today's conversation with. Online, I have, have subscribed to receive letters from the universe via www.tut.com, T-U-T. Their logo says, thoughts become things, choose the good ones. On Black Friday, November 23rd, My message from the universe was this. A holiday shopping tip from your friend, the universe. During the merriment of your retail adventures, Betty, should you ever have to ask the clerk how much, always follow their reply with raised eyebrows, a slight gasp, and a disbelieving, that's all? Santa's watching the universe. So the universe sees and hears all. When you give this season or any season, be grateful. Give thanks to the universe for your ability to give. Have a very very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, back to you, John. Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio listeners. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true, minus the alien abduction dreams. That is not cool at all. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. And welcome back to the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Is there a monster, and I use the word monster with quotation marks, in Loch Ness? Or maybe he's out and about it. Tonight's guest is no slouch when it comes to this wonderful mythos. Uh, to be honest, I actually heard him on other podcasts many years ago. Once his first book came out, The Water Horses of Loch Ness. It was a fascinating read, which actually documented a lot of the sightings and stuff like that of Nessie prior to 1933 when things became more prevalent in the media. Now, with another book out just recently called When Monsters Come Ashore, tonight I'm going to be having a very merry Loch Ness miss with my guest, Roland Watson. Roland, how are you tonight? I'm good, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. And I'll be honest, up here in good old Newfoundland, you know, we're in Canada, about as far east as you can get in Canada. We're not too far away. <laughs> We're about as close as we can get. But the reality of it is, 
Well, mm-hmm. not a lot of people know who Roland Watson is. So please tell me, Roland, how you got involved with this mythos, how you got involved with the Loch Ness Mystery. Well, uh, Jonathan, part, part of it is because I'm Scottish. So uh, basically, Loch Ness Monster is Scotland's biggest mystery. Uh, and as a kid, I was always interested in dinosaurs and UFOs and ghosts. So it's quite natural that uh, I'd take an interest in what was this. And uh, when I was a kid back in the 70s, uh, there was a big... We had Nessie fever, basically, because we had the, the famous Robert Rhine's underwater gargoyle body photographs, and that was around 1975. That, that kind of grabbed me, and I began to get interested, read the books. I even did some studies myself, wrote to people. Uh, that was into the 80s. I uh, went to university, still interested. And then kind of tailed off after that. I started my job career. Then I got married, had kids. and uh, But it never went away. I was always interested. I always believed there was something large, strange, in the dark waters of Loch Ness. So around 2010... Uh, I went, I went still around the internet. I was looking at the forums, looking at other websites. I realised that Nessie was getting a rather bad press. She was getting a lot of uh, being put down and debunked by people who just didn't believe there was anything there. So I thought the, the internet needed a kind of counterbalance. So I started my blog uh, in 2010. It's now reached its eighth year. It's done over 600 articles, some in Ian, some not uh, much gravity, but others which are studies, which have found new things, add more credence to the, the mystery, and uh, still going strong. I've written two books, as you said, and I'm working on a third. I think it's wonderful that I actually got to learn new names about Nessie. You know, I just associate him with the word Loch Ness, but reality is there's many ways of describing this creature. One is water horse. Uh <laughs> And, you know, I remember an old movie that came out many years ago called The Water Horse, and I always kind of wonder where that came from, and here it was. It's actually right from Scotland itself. So that's really, really interesting. Yeah. Tell me a little tiny bit about that first book, a little bit more, The Water Horse is a Loch Ness. You know, what would be the difference between this and many other, you know, so many other books out there about uh, the Loch Ness Monster? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that book was uh, filling a niche, a niche in the market. There was a gap, I mean, a lot of Nessie books basically told you about what people had seen since 1933. Uh, talked about expeditions, talked about personalities, talked about science, talked about a lot of things. But none of them really went backwards into time and try and link the past with the present. So I went about searching through all the old books, all the old newspapers. I mean, we had, we had some data out there already because people did talk about the water horse. Uh, the old Gaelic word is Echusk, which means uh, water horse, and it's called a water horse because it lives in the water and it looks like a horse. So uh, basically, I thought, well, let's just look through all, all the literature. Back then, you had a Victorian uh, anthropologist who went up to the Highlands and basically collected all these old Gaelic stories, which is quite timely because the Industrial Revolution was beginning to move and all these old stories were beginning to fade from memory because they were all a lot of oral tradition. So these Victorian guys came along, put it on paper, and over 100 years later, we can look at them, we can look back, we can study, cross-compare all the various stories. So basically, I gathered all the stories about the Loch Ness Kelpie, or the Loch Ness Water Horse, or the Loch Ness Water Bull. I collated other Loch stories, Loch Mora, Loch O, Loch Loch, uh, so on, Loch Lomond. And I, I found it... By far, the most prevalent stories about water horses came from Loch Ness, even back then. And uh, basically, I studied the stories, the content. You know, I asked myself one question, you know. Some people said these stories about water horses were meant to uh, dissuade, dissuade kids from going near the water and not get drowned, which seemed perfectly rational. But when we actually look at the stories, you ask yourself, well, if this is a water monster, why do we get so many stories about it on land? And basically, we get stories about water horses which are nowhere near the loch. So what kind of deterrent is that to getting drowned? So uh, I basically discovered it. Well, I didn't discover it. My, my thesis was that, uh, that the legend 
the legends of these water horses, and basically water horses are described in quite uh, cultural terms, the same way if you watch a Loch Ness horror movie or, or or the water horse film, you just get cultural overlays of what people think the monster looks like. So back then they thought it looked like a horse. So where uh, underneath that was the kernel of truth that there was a large creature in the water, yes, but also coming onto land, and that was the the truth or the kernel of truth, which uh, the tribal the re- not the racial memory, the tribal memories of our Highland clan ancestors uh, basically formed their stories, and these are stories which were told around the fireplace, around the keelies. Stories which were partly to educate, but also to entertain, but also to warn. Because these people genuinely believed there was a large, fearsome creature in this loch, and you didn't really know what to go at night. And if you saw a, a beautiful horse uh, ready to ride, don't go near it, because if you sat on it, you stick to it, it would turn into the water kelpie and dive into the loch and eat you alive. So that, that's the story in a nutshell, and that's one of my book. Uh, which also has a kind of paranormal, supernatural thread to it, because back then, the water horse was seen as a demonic steed or a supernatural entity. And I tried to trace that that oldest of Loch Ness monster theories to the present day, and people who uh, associate, still to this day associate the Loch Ness monster with paranormal theory, as opposed to plesiosaurs. Uh, giant eels, etc. Yeah, like that's the most common one yeah. I've heard of, the plesiosaur. So uh, this changes everything from because as far as I know, the plesiosaur was 100% aquatic. Uh, you know, just from what I've heard. Then again, yeah. though, I'm not exactly an expert on the topic. <laughs> I uh, I do very much find it very interesting that you kind of segued it from folklore a little bit there, and I, and I think that's really interesting. It definitely gives a new perspective, you know, and I can really respect the research and. Countless hours of research that must have went into that, Roland. Uh, good on you. Let's talk a little tiny sure. bit about when monsters come ashore. I think this is just mm-hmm. one of the main reasons why I wanted to get you on the podcast, because I'm going to be mm-hmm. honest, it's the first time I've ever heard of, you know, the Loch Ness Monster not in the water. So can you give us maybe a couple of the accounts that have been recorded in history, maybe even something more recent? Uh, I don't know if you've got a something that happened more recently or anything like that. About the Loch Ness Monster, or maybe something you maybe documented in your book? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, well, Nessie on land, fascinating subject. I'm not the only one who's uh, found this one of the most uh, interesting aspects of the phenomena. Uh, but for a, for, a, for a beast that's fantastical in itself, you know, to have it on land is even more fantastical. And so fantastical, in fact, that some Loch Ness Monster researchers don't accept it. And I'm talking about people that believe in the Loch Ness Monster. So we go, it's a divisive subject, but at the same time fascinating. Because, uh, as I said, it links back to the water kelpie legend. Uh, but it came into focus uh, in modern days, 1933, with the George Spicer event, where he was uh, basically a tailor from La- a Savile Row tailor shop in London with his wife coming back from a holiday Scotland on the quieter south shore July afternoon warm day he's seen his motor along he just suddenly saw this loathsome thing that he could only approximate to a prehistoric monster lumbering across the road in front of him because if what he said was true uh, we have this idea that the Loch Ness Monster becomes the largest land animal on earth bigger than an elephant so we have this largest land animal on earth lumbering in front of him and his wife uh, uh, spare 200 yards away, sees it for seconds, they slow down, the, the degree, kind of, they almost describe it as like a, a rising stomach. Uh, crossing the road, they go walk past, they drive past, they see the, the large hole in the undergrowth where it crashed through. So they go on uh, to the village uh, nearby, foyers, and they learn that there's a monster in the loch. And uh, another guy, Learn our story. William McCulloch cycled out to the site and corroborated their story. He said that he found the uh, undergrowth that looked like a bulldozer going through it. So that uh, story, he wrote to the local Inverness courier saying, guess what I saw? Because <clears throat> he wasn't expecting 
People talk about people uh, having a sense of expectation, which can make them see things they don't really see. But nobody, not even he, was expecting to see this thing crossing the road in front of him, because after all, it lives in the water. So uh, he sees it. The editor of the Inverness Courier says, was so, he regarded the story so sensational, he felt he had to get some expert in to explain it away as a line of waters crossing the road. So uh, that became national news. It became part of the modern folklore. Other stories followed. 1930s has about a dozen land sightings. Arthur Grant is the other famous one uh, from January 1934. Uh, and we have other stories. People came forward. When this happened, people came forward with a story saying, I saw the monster land in 1919. I saw the monster land in 1879. Now the guy saying, I saw the monster in 1932. So these stories came, came out. And you had this explosion of things being seen on the land. Big, grey, lumbering le- leviathans. Some people describe flippers. Some people describe three-webbed toes, three-toed webbed foot. Some people describe uh, seeing uh, the tail or other things. Some people think they see it carrying body parts. Uh, other people see it left tracks. So uh, we come in to that era, 30s, and then there was a great silence. We came up to the war, 1940s, 1950s. No one reported a single land sighting. Which I think quite interesting because if uh, people uh, explain this away as just otters or deers dashing across the road, then why weren't people misidentifying it back in the 40s, 50s? So nothing happened again until 1960 when a man called Torco McLeod was on the north side of the loch and it was a drizzly day. He looked across the loch with his binoculars and saw this large grey beast with a long neck and two flippers half out of the water. Uh, apparently, as it were, kind of scavenging on the land. And uh, he said... He had, he had graticulations on his binoculars, so he could work out the size of it by looking at my almanac, and he reckoned it was 45 feet long. And he watched this thing uh, for eight minutes, so there was no room for doubt. He had plenty of time to identify, or rather, you know, make sure it wasn't something else. And he watched it through binoculars, so it was effectively 200 yards away. And it, it dropped back into the water, and it was gone. And that's one that that, that kind of kick-started uh, things again. We've had various other sightings, but the most recent one uh, was by Ian Moncton. And he, in 2009, claims he saw something. Well, he didn't actually see something. That's an interesting thing. He was heading, this is back in February 2009, he was heading back to his lodgings with his fiancée, and he stopped at a lay-by, and he said he heard a, a splashing a splashing sound as if a car had just been thrown into the lock. So he he put he put he pulled up his car, put the headlights, turned the car towards the lock, put the headlights on, and he just flashed his mobile phone camera down towards where he thought the source of noise was. And out came this picture of something weird. Uh, it looks like the monster. Some people describe it looking like a giant roast chicken because of the way it looks. So uh, that's a mystery, but that's the only photograph we have purportedly of the Loch Ness Monster land. We've had some other recent land sightings. In 2004, Scottish girl and two Canadian friends claimed they saw an enormous 30-foot eel-like creature uh, on the beach. Back in 1999, an anonymous person on the Doors Foyers Road claimed they saw a 33 foot monster with long neck cross the road in front of them, a bit like the Spicers. And there it goes on. It's still being seen, but these are still rare sightings. There's only about 35 land sightings compared to nearly 2,000 water sightings. So that in proportion, they're very rare. And on average, on average they only happen once every six years. So if you're driving along the road to Loch Ness tomorrow, uh, I think you're more likely to win the, the, the lottery than see the monster. 
Yeah, but that didn't stop me putting my dash cam on the, on my camera just in case. <laughs> and understandable, of course. You know, it's such a plethora yeah. of stories and a giant, uh, just amazing knowledge base on yeah. this just wonderful cryptid. You know, I'm sure by now you probably got some of your own ideas of what Nessie actually is. Uh, you know, what do you mm-hmm. think he is? I've gone through various phases. Uh, back, go back to what I previously mentioned. I was a kid. I went with a flow. I thought it was a plesiosaur. Not not the kind of plesiosaur uh, that you see in the uh, dinosaur books because, you know, 65 million years old, excuse me, you expect it to have changed a bit. So yeah, that, that's the prevalent view. It was popular in the 60s. Some I went along with it. Then I kind of got paranormal about it. And I thought... Well, maybe it's maybe it's not a real flesh and blood creature, and that it's uh, I called it a tulpa, which kind of thought form, which can be could be brought into existence either by at that time I thought it collected unconscious of my kind or maybe some outside entity. Yeah, thought about that, then I kind of dropped it. Because I thought, well, had you, if, the, if those rhines underwater photographs are true, could you could paranormal things live underwater? So, well, along with that, uh, I came into the present day. I said I started my blog. Yeah, I take the view it might kind of be a some kind of exotic fish, not a catfish, not a sturgeon, but something we just don't know about, uh, 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 which has a long, in which the long neck, which we call the neck, actually might be a long proboscis. Uh, nothing to do with a neck, no brain in it, just a proboscis or something. Uh, or something amphibious. That's still the way I'm inclined just now, but to tell you the truth, I can't really put an ID on it. Uh, I mean, the Plesia still, the Plesia Sothese still has some appeal, uh, but I think uh, it's something, it's a water breather. It doesn't, if, we, if it came off of air, we'd see it a lot more frequently. No, no doubt about it. So I think it's probably something that's a water breather. It lives in the bottom of a lock, or maybe it crawls around the sides. It doesn't really swim around much. It's more an ambush predator. It just waits for things to come along and it grabs them, like salmon when they're running down the side of the lock. So it's pretty much a creature that keeps itself to itself. And only if it does come up to the surface, it's merely purely by accident, I would say. I and I do think that they do, I do think they go in and out of the loch. Because if I, we've had reports of creatures seen in the River Ness, which connects Loch Ness to the sea. So they, there's a potential they can come out and out of the loch uh, in an in a re- irregular, unpredictable manner. I think it's very much, uh, very possible that there is an, on, you know, just basically an unidentified uh, creature. I, I, very much so. And because I'm from Newfoundland, mm-hmm. I know firsthand of, you know, the possibility. Because for, you know, many thousands of years, the, the, you know, the old story of the Kraken was thrown around by people, the giant squid that was yep. the size of boats. And people are always, you know, just, you know, it was full of folklore, stuff like that. They just pretty much said, you know what, there's no such thing as this. This doesn't exist. And then one washed up on shore right here in Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in fact, the first ever carcass was, was found here in Newfoundland. And I'm very, very proud to say that, yes, indeed, that cryptid is very real. In fact, as of now, they've actually got mm-hmm. him on video, too. Just, it's just a gigantic type of animal that just, you know, wasn't really prevalent. Is it possible that these things are in the sea and coming to the lock, then? I didn't even know there was a, a river that connected the lock to the ocean. This this is all yeah. new knowledge to me. This is great. <laughs> well, well, this is basically a sea serpent. Whatever, you know, whatever you want to call a sea serpent, but... Uh, if you map sea serpent, there's a lot of sea serpent sightings around Scotland, around the Western Isles, Orkney, mainly on the Western seaboard of the Atlantic. And uh, basically some of them come into Loch Ness. Some of them stay there, some of them go away. Some of them get into other lochs in Scotland. But basically they're semi-itinerant. They come and go. But I think there's always one or two there. Uh, and whether they breed, whether there's a colony of them there is another matter. But the, mo- the most that's ever been seen in a lock, I think, is three at a time. Three have been seen at once. Uh, so yeah, it's a sea serpent. Uh, possibly some of them may have got trapped in the lock. 
I mean, just because one can get out doesn't mean the others can. I mean, seals, seals can get into Loch Ness. Uh, seals have been spotted at Loch Ness. Uh, they maybe get into Loch maybe once every two years. They generally get shot because uh, they begin to eat the salmon, and uh, which is one of the reasons they go into the loch. If they're chasing, they're chasing the salmon. Uh, some people have even claimed that dolphins have got into Loch Ness, which is that requires quite special conditions. They wouldn't get out again. So, uh, and any that do stay in the loch, they die, they sink to the bottom, they get scavenged, and somewhere in the loch bottom, we've got some skeletons of Nessie. I like to think that's Not probably where yet. they're too, if, if there is. Because, you know, it doesn't seem like the type of place where things would wash ashore like that Kraken did, so to speak, or a giant squid did here in Newfoundland, you know what I mean? Because mm. that's rolling waves, giant waves, like we're talking the Atlantic Ocean where I'm from. It's pretty much mm. going to pound everything it can get close range. Anything comes off those grand banks outside of Newfoundland, it's it's stuck here forever. We've had many carcasses washed up. So I guess what you're trying to say there is really an answer to a question that, you know, a lot of people, especially the skeptical bed people, would be, you know, where's the body of this monster to? And, and you're saying pretty much, hey man, it's probably at the bottom of the lock. And it's probably underneath a lot of sediment yeah. by the sounds of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Loch Ness, the Loch Ness is part of a geological fault. Bit like San Andreas fault. It's just a, a basically a cleft in a rock, a V-shaped cleft. So the sides of the lock are very steep. So there's no tides either. So nothing gets washed ashore unless it's already decomposed, or bloated and floating from maybe upriver. So if it dies, basically drops to the bottom. Now the other factors that come into play are as you drop to the bottom, the water pressure increases. So any gas bubbles that form due to decomposition are, are compressed. So there's less chance of them being able to achieve buoyancy to rise to the top. And we have eels at the bottom lock. They'll, they'll, they'll make short work of anything that falls to the bottom. And yes, uh, the silt, we have silt, PT, PT particles come into the lock from all the various streams that run into the lock. And we reckon that the deposition rate is about one millimetre a year. So let's say something died in 1933, 80 years ago. We've got about 80, going on nearly a metre of silt. Uh, uh, sorry, 80, uh, let me recalculate, 80 millimetres. So that's about 10, eight, 8 centimetres. And that's quite a lot and, uh, for the, a, a person. Like, say, I'm not going to say a scuba diver would ever go down there and do this, but... Well, maybe even a submarine to go down there and dig. I mean, you've got to, like, it's one in a million to find this thing, even if it's dead, basically. Well, you're not allowed to dredge a lock. No, I wouldn't it's imagine. It's the law. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it, it's actually important not to dredge a lock, because the, the, the silt, the silt at the bottom lock is basically a geological record. So people can take core samples of lock, and they can detect things like the Chernobyl radio- radioactive signature in the, in the core sample 30 years ago. Oh, that's really fascinating. Right I didn't know about that. That's really cool. Uh, so they actually found that? Yeah, yeah. In, oh. the, in the core sample, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. And you can go, go you can go right down to the last ice age when Loch Ness was covered in ice. No monsters before then. They'd been frozen out. So uh, you got the silt. Um, sonar is getting better. But the, the monster doesn't really swim in open waters because the open water, there's not much fish there to chase. All the fish, the majority, or rather the best pickings are on the sides of the loch, which we call the littoral region of the waters. Um, so if you're going to find a monster, you're more likely to either find it in the sides or possibly just at the surface, uh, the top. 10 metres have more fish because it's near the, the, the plankton, which uh, in turn are nearer to the light, near the surface of the water. So uh, sonar has found various things, uh, tantalising traces. Uh, back in 1987, we had Operation Deep Scan, in which uh, a good few dozen uh, boats equipped with Lowry and sonar formed a curtain of sonar across the lock and went up it. And they found three sonar contacts they could not explain. Now, uh, because when they went back, when the follow-up ship went back, 
the traces had disappeared. Um, other traces were found to just be uh, pieces, pieces of a taco or something floating in the water. The three sona contacts were found but had disappeared. And, you know, people say, well, maybe it was seals. Uh, but if it was seals, uh, it would have been spotted uh, coming up to the surface to breathe. Seals are curious creatures. They come up to boats. There was no seals in Loch Ness that day, I'm pretty sure. So sonar is a, has found things. The sonar is a bit of a blunt instrument because it can't really get you a good resolution on what you're looking at. Yeah. What you need is a good film, a photograph, really. Okay, time for you to pick your brain. Just a little tiny bit because we're getting close to the end of this. And I, and I want to make sure I yeah. ask you know the, the important questions. Let's say that money is no object to you whatsoever. You have all the staff you could ever have, all the money you could ever want. And you want to go and try to find the Loch Ness monster? What would be the first thing you'd do that you can't do right now? Well, I'll just go back to what I said. Uh, I would the, the sonar sonar has developed such a, such a stage that they've now got a form of sonar which is like a guided missile or torpedo. So you can tell the sonar where to go. You can make it uh, go along along the sides of the loch. And you'll get a much better resolution picture. You get a much finer detail. It's almost optical in its resolution. Uh, I'd use that. I'd go along the lock. I'd go along the bottom, trying to find the uh, carcass remains. It this basically be my eyes underwater. And because uh, basically, if you want to get this creature, you have to go where it is. You don't wait for it to come to you. You've got to go to it. So that, that's what I'd do if I had no money, uh, rather lots of money. I have no money just now, but I've had lots of money. That's what I'd do. Well, you know what? This is our Christmas special, a very merry Loch Ness Miss. I'll be sure to write a letter to Santa Claus and see what he can do for you this year, okay? Guys, Loch Ness yep. Mystery blogspot com is where you're going to check it out. Reclaiming the Loch Ness Monster from the current tide of debunking and skepticism. If you believe there's something strange in Loch Ness, please check out Loch Ness Mystery blogspot Dot com. Roland's got two amazing books, The Water Horses of Loch Ness, and, of course, his most recent one, When Monsters Come Ashore, Stories of the Loch Ness Monster on Land. A fascinating read. Roland, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, and you have yourself a very Merry Christmas. Thank you, Jonathan. You too. Well, the time to say goodbye is upon us. But don't worry, you can keep track of the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast very easily. It's available on Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, and TuneIn Radio. Just look for the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast banner. Of course, if you'd like to keep up to date, you can always check out the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast Facebook page, drop a like, and every single time a new show goes up, you'll be notified. You can also follow me, John Mallard, on Twitter, at O-D-D-T-O-N-F-L-D. That's odd to Newfoundland. From the oldest city in North America, I bid you adieu. From the odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast.